Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, George Smith here with Augment. I'm super excited to have Paul Green join us today in part one of this marketing versus sales series that we're looking at. So thank you, everyone, for attending. If you're watching this at a later date, thanks for signing up and, and joining us, too. Uh, Paul, really happy to have you here today. Thanks so much for joining me. No, thank you so much for having me on. And it is the perpetual argument, which is more important than marketing or sales. And we know that sales is what puts the money in the bank. The most MSPs, they do all right at sales. They're good at sales. Their problem is actually getting in front of enough people to start with. And that is what one of the things uh, that marketing can help you to do is not specifically what we're talking about today. But we all know that marketing is more, more important, right? You agree, don't you, George? Well, I'm, I'm certainly here to be convinced, Paul. And I think with the cyber crime being at an all time high, it's, it's definitely something that's keeping MSPs up at night. But I mean, end users, uh, even folks like uh, like my parents, my wife, they just don't seem to understand really the, the, the imminent threat and the repercussions and the outcomes that can severely impact them through poor cyber hygiene. So really excited that that's our, our focus on today is in terms of waking up your clients to the threats of cyber crime. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you and you can kind of walk us through how you would approach it and encourage MSPs to do the same with their folks today. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And thanks again for having me on because cybersecurity is such a massive, massive subject. As you said, people don't seem to know what they don't seem to know. And in the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to look at how we can use marketing to wake them up, to grab them by the shoulders, wake them up and make them realize that actually cybersecurity in 2023, certainly in 24, 25, if we're looking forward, it's going to get scarier and scarier and scarier. Now, before we start, let me just tell you a little bit about me so you understand who I am and why I'm credible to, to be on this webinar with George and to talk about marketing. So my name is Paul Green. I'm an MSP marketing expert. I'm the host of Paul Green's MSP marketing podcast, and through our MSP Marketing Edge program, I work with more than 700 MSPs all around the world. Uh, we've got a huge bunch in the UK, an even bigger bunch in the US, and we work on helping them to generate more leads and win more clients, but also upselling to existing clients. Because if you think of the three ways to grow your business, and there are only three ways to grow any business, it's number one is to go and get more new clients. That's kind of obvious. Number two is to get those clients to choose to buy more from you. And number three is to get those clients to spend more with you. Now, those are the three standard ways to grow any business for MSPs, particularly if you are a full MSP and it's all about the monthly recurring revenue. Sure, you want to bring in those new clients, but actually you should be dedicating as much of your management time to upselling your existing clients as you are bringing on board new clients. And the upselling of the existing clients needs to be done in a way which never leaves a bitter taste in their mouth. And I'm, I'm sure you would never do this, but you must never ever risk the ongoing relationship with your client just to sell them something else. Instead, what we need to do is we need to find, uh, uncover and discover things that they are scared of or needs that they have, or better still, wants that they have. What's the difference between needs and wants? Well, you might need a new car, but once you've driven one, you want a $50,000 Tesla. Very, you don't need, no one needs a Tesla, but you want a Tesla. That's that's a, an example there. And we can use exactly the same when we're selling managed services, especially with cybersecurity. So what we're going to talk about as we go through here today, and yes, this will be recorded and Augment will make uh, this webinar available to you on the recording afterwards. We're going to talk about how to tackle this in five different parts. I promise you I'm going to keep this super simple. I'm going to break it down and make it as granular as possible, but you will walk away from this in 20 minutes or so uh, with a very practical plan of how you can get started on selling, waking up your, your existing clients and selling more cybersecurity services to them. As we're going along, please do ask questions. Now, I can't see the, uh, the the Zoom interface that you've got, but there'll either be a questions box or a chat box or a Q&A box, something like that. As we're going along, please do put your questions in there. We will have time at the end and George will read out some of your questions and I'll happily answer any of your questions related to this or indeed any other marketing subject. So let's jump into part one. And in part one, we've got to understand how ordinary people think. Now, when I say ordinary people, I mean not you. I mean, not tech people. I'm kind of used to be an ordinary person, but I've I've spent, so I've been in the MSP world uh, since 2016. So what's that? Seven years. 
Uh, so I, I, although I am, I'm not a tech and I don't run an MSP, I still think a little bit like an ordinary business owner, but I am so much more aware than the average person about cybersecurity, malware, you know, how to explain or how to understand exactly what something like the cloud is. You know, if you go in, and I'm sure you've done this with your existing clients, you ask an existing client or anybody you're talking to who's not in our world, you ask them to explain what malware is. They might just know that it stands for malicious software, and they might say it's viruses or something like that, which obviously it isn't. There's more than that. But they don't really know how to describe it. If you ask them to describe what happens during a ransomware attack or how long cyber criminals might sit in a system before actually launching the attack itself, which, as you and I know, can be days, weeks, potentially even months. If you ask them to explain something as basic as the cloud, something that we all use all day, every day, and you ask them to explain what that actually is, could they do that in a single sentence that a 12-year-old would understand? Of course they can't, because they're ordinary people. So we've got to kind of think and look at the world as ordinary people do in order to understand them. And what's really important is once we understand how they think and how they feel, and especially how they feel, thinking is where the, the, the sort of the brain decisions are made. But most buying decisions with technology, when ordinary people are buying technology, they're making the buying decision with their hearts. They're buying based on emotions. In fact, they picked you. And in fact, your, your prospects pick you or don't pick you based on how they feel about you. They don't pick you based on accreditations or qualifications or certifications, all those Asians. They buy you based on whether or not they like you. It's crazy, isn't it? You could actually be a rubbish MSP and terrible at what you do. And obviously that would have a massive effect on retention, but it won't stop you from winning new clients because they pick you based on the fact they like you. So we've got to look at how ordinary people think how ordinary people feel, and make sure that when we're talking to them, we're not talking down to them, but instead we're coming down to their level. We've got to drop down to their level in order to communicate effectively to them about these things that they don't understand. So there are three big reasons why ordinary people uh, clients, and we're talking decision makers here, business owners and managers. I'm not talking about consumers. I'm just focused on the people you want to do business with. Three big reasons why they are not terrified. And the first is it's only on the fringes of their attention. So, you know, when a big hack happens every year, there's a big hack, isn't there? It's either, you know, a billion records from this app gets dumped or another big compromise. Now, you and I know that there are hacks every day that there's new information flooding the dark web every day. But for the average person that only reads normal news outlets, they don't know that this stuff is happening all of the time. They're vaguely aware of it because of the old big hack, but it's very much just on the fringes of their attention. You and I, because I do read a lot of the same stuff that you read, so I can stay up to date with what's happening in this world. We know pretty much what's happening in the channel, what's happening in the tech world. They don't. They really aren't aware of it at all. The other reason that it doesn't terrify them is that they don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, they can't explain it. As I said, try getting someone to explain what malware actually is or what a ransomware attack looks like or what are the consequences of a ransomware attack? If you ever asked a client that and they would think, oh yeah, that would be a pain. We'd have to call you a couple of hours later, we'd get back to work. They have no idea that they could be down for a week or even longer, depending on how bad the attack is. So the so far, we've looked at the fact it's only on the fringes of their attention and then that they don't understand it and they can't explain it. And the third reason why they are not terrified is because they perceive it only affects big businesses, that it doesn't affect them. And remember, big businesses are only kind of like 4% of all businesses. So something like 95, 96% of all businesses worldwide are considered to be small businesses. You've got to be very, very big to be big. You know, that kind of, you know, you're, you're a public company, you're in one of the one of the top charts, you've got thousands of employees. Let's be honest, you're not supporting many of those, if any at all, because those are what we call mega whale clients. So the vast majority of your clients are probably small businesses, whether they consider themselves a small business or not. They perceive the only people who get hacked and who get attacked and who get targeted by criminals are the big name companies, the airlines, the major pharmaceuticals, the hospitals, the councils, the governments. They don't understand that actually these attacks are automated to a certain extent, that cyber criminals are targeting all companies all of the time. And what we've got to do is we've got to make them aware of that. So let's move on to the second part. 
And don't forget, as we're going through, if you do have any questions on this, please do uh, pop this into uh, into the chat. Now, the second part is pretty much covering off or telling you what we're going to cover in the rest of this webinar, because the second part is about waking them up. And I truly believe that to wake up your existing clients and, in fact, your future prospects, you can't just do it haphazardly. You have to have a system. You need to have a strategy and a system. And this is no different to any marketing, all of your marketing. You need to have a strategy and a system. I'm a big fan of systems. I love with the MSPs I work with and to all MSPs I speak to, I say, look, with your marketing, put in place a system, series of tasks that can happen on either a daily, a weekly or a monthly basis. In all, because, because the second you start doing something systematically on a regular basis, it's much more likely to happen than if it's just some kind of haphazard thing. There are three things that we need to put together for your strategic systematic approach. And I'm going to spend the rest of this webinar going into details on them. They are this. First of all, you need to make this kind of this cybercrime relevant to them. The second thing is you then need to repeat that message again and again and again. And the third thing is that you need to remove their choice. We're going to make it easy for them by making it difficult for them to make a bad decision. And that is going to be a potentially painful process for you to do because you are going to force your clients down a specific path. We'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. So let's look at the first of those and making it relevant to them. Now, I want to share a little story with you. If I can, I'm not sure if we've got any UK MSPs uh, on the on the webinar, but I am, as you can tell by my voice, I am based in the UK. Uh, I live at, in the moment uh, just outside a city called Milton Keynes, right in the centre of the UK. If you don't know the UK well, you won't know Milton Keynes because no one ever does. Uh, but it was the it was a new city built 60 years ago, and it's the only city in the UK that's built on a US style grid system. So we don't have traffic jams here, which is really cool. But I haven't always lived here. In fact, 20 years ago. I lived here and this was, uh, it doesn't look very pleasant and it was even less pleasant when I lived there. Beginning of my career, actually it was about 25 years ago, beginning of my career, uh, sort of early to mid twenties. And this was in a place called Nottingham, which you will have heard of because of course, Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham. Nottingham's a lovely place in fiction. And the reality is if you actually live in Nottingham in the real life, of course there are some nice parts. They've got gates to stop people getting in. Uh, but the place where I lived, which is called the Arboretum area of Nottingham, is all now student housing. And in the nine months that my then girlfriend and me, or 12 months I think it was, that my then girlfriend and me lived in Nottingham, we were burgled twice. And Paul, yep, we twice. actually they have came someone, in. Uh, we, sorry, Paul, to interrupt. I just want to let you know uh, we actually That's have okay. a, a, an MSP from Nottingham uh, on, on the call today. Oh. So Danny Chaplin oh, here. Perfect. Today. Okay. Oh, yes. Hi, Danny. How are you? So now, Danny, anything bad I said about Nottingham there? Let me just backtrack a little bit. But I'm sure you live in one of those gated communities, uh, Danny, that's very, very nice. Uh, but I'm sure if you also know the Arboretum area, which is just up from the shopping centre, it's not a place you'd want to live. Um, so, yeah, we got we got burgled twice in 12 months. They broke in, uh, smashed a window, nicked some stuff and then waited a few weeks till we'd replaced it and then came in and nicked it all again. And that was the point at which we my girlfriend and I, bearing in mind, we were in our mid 20s and no one takes anything seriously when they're in the mid 20s. That was the point that we got really serious about security and we fitted a burglar alarm and we actually fitted bars to the window, which it seems insane now. And we got really serious about it. And here's the thing. We had a, a crime prevention officer who's like a someone who works for the local police force who came around to see us after our second burglary and, and was giving us all these stats about the number of burglaries in the area. And my girlfriend and I looked at each other and we, we kind of said, well, we said this exact same thing to the, to the crime prevention officer. We said, the thing is, stats don't work. Burglaries are what work. Because we'd seen all of those stats before. You read them in the newspapers, you hear them, that one in X houses around here will get burgled. But it doesn't feel real to you, does it? Until you get burgled. And what was really interesting was the flat above us and the flat below us, they fitted extra security measures off the back of our burglary. So even though they hadn't been burgled or, or as you say, in the US burglarized, they went on and fitted other security measures as well. And I've seen that in subsequent houses. Touch wood, I haven't been burgled since, but I've seen, you know, other houses burgled and it's made me fit cameras and, uh, you know, security uh, devices and stuff like that. The lesson from this is that if you want to make something relevant to people, you've got to make it real to them. Showing someone a stat showing that, I don't know what, 30% of businesses will experience some kind of cybersecurity breach in the next 12 months. That means nothing to them at all. We've got to make it real to them. We've got to make it relevant to them. 
How do we do that? Well, here's a couple of ways that you can do it. First of all, you can use your good friend dark web monitoring. Now, there are lots of different ways of getting dark web monitoring going. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine has a service called mspdarkweb.com. Uh, Go and have a look at that. There's, of course, there's a Kaseya service. I forget what it's called now. Um, it's been around for a while. There's lots and lots of different services for this around. Um, of course, you can always use Have I Been Pwned, which is the free service. It's limited amounts of information, but it will tell you that there has been uh, you know, this email address has been has been breached or has been leaked onto the dark web in some way. And even something as simple and very basic as dark web monitoring or even just have I been pwned is what, what to you and me, that's every day. We know about this. They don't. I know this from talking to MSPs who do cybersecurity lunch and learns. And as part of it, if they've got five or six people in the room, they'll get an email address off every single one and put it through a dark web monitoring or put it through Have I Been Pwned? And, you know, we know that three out of four people with a with a, an aged email address on Have I Been Pwned will have been breached somewhere. It's a little bit embarrassing when it turns out to be the, uh, Mad the Ashley Madison uh, breach, Madison Ashley, whatever you call it. Obviously, I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's one of the ways that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, bring it to life for them. Another thing that you can do is just do a basic show and tell. I know an MSP who, and this is so smart, if you get the opportunity to do this, do this. I know an MSP who has a laptop and it used to belong to one of his clients who had a ransomware attack. So you open it up, it's the proper red screen with the message. I, I've never personally seen one in real life. I've obviously seen many examples of it, but not in real life. But they they took this from the client with permission. They removed the Wi-Fi card or the thing that stops it. So basically it can't, it can't infect anyone. Uh, it's never connected to anything, uh, but they've got it and they can show it as an example. And they actually take that to meetings where they want to show uh, their clients what a, ran uh, what a, um, a ransomware attack actually looks like. And they show them and say, look, this is the red screen. This is the message. Uh, when you see something like this, you are screwed for 10 days or however long it takes on average to fix something like this. Which I think that kind of show and tell is really, really smart. Um, I know another MSP who takes that a step further and they they talk to their heart and not their brain because even showing them a someone else's old laptop in, isn't in itself a particularly emotive thing to do. But I do know another MSP who in the middle of a meeting with their client. So this is like an upsell meeting or an account management meeting, perhaps a QBR, a quarterly business review. They will actually just suddenly stop the meeting, close the client's laptop, pick up the laptop, walk out of the building with them and say, if that was it, and you suddenly had no access whatsoever to your computer and all of your staff's computer, what problems is that going to cause? And then they just, they literally stand outside the building and they talk it through. And of course, you know, immediately they'll, there's a bit of bravado, isn't there? Which is, oh, we'll be all right. I've got a backup. I've got a this, I've got a that. But then you start to think through the implications of it. Actually, when did the last backup happen? What data have we generated today? What if we can't access any of our cloud data for the next three days? What about the phone system? And can we use the phones without this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where you, the more you can make it real uh, to someone, the, the easier it is to actually start to get through to their heart. The other thing to remember is that in general, most people are more motivated by the fear of loss than they are the opportunity to gain. Let me say that again, because that is a key thing to remember about human beings. Most humans are more motivated by the fear of loss than they are the opportunity to gain. And I'm trying to get this example clear in my head before I say it, but if I said to you, uh, for example, uh, uh, I can show you how to protect a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds you've got in the bank versus I can show you how to turn that thousand into 1200, uh, most people, I haven't, I haven't done this example very well, but most people uh, would rather know how to protect the thousand, to keep the thousand they've got, rather than than essentially you know have an opportunity gamble it to to increase it to twelve hundred. Um, you know that whole thing of when you started your MSP, that when you had nothing, right? You didn't have any assets. You probably didn't own your own house. Maybe you were you were even single, or it was very low level relationships. Do you remember back then how you just went for it? You took huge risks, right? And you just went for it because you had nothing to lose, right? And now maybe you've been going a number of years. You've got some assets together. You've got staff that you want to protect. You've got maybe another half and a family. You've got a nice car and you've got a nice life. Sure, it's hard work, but you've got something to lose. Have you noticed how you take fewer big risks? You might still take risks, but they're more measured risks. It's, this is exactly the same thing that once we've got stuff, we don't want to lose it. So we're actually helping or you're helping your clients here by showing them 
the things that could happen. And we, we're trying, what we're trying to do is put in place insurance policies. We're trying to give them things that they should invest in to protect their business uh, so that they never, ever, ever uh, have to, or, or it's, it's unlikely they will experience this kind of loss. Let's move on to part four. And part four is taking the messages we were just talking about and repeating those messages again and again and again. I'm going to show you a photo. It's another thing from my past. This is a photo of me from 1997 uh, when I was a radio presenter. So that's me, age 23. It's me on the right. Look, no grey hair. Uh, and that was me doing a, an outside broadcast for a radio station in Northampton, uh, which is a, a city about 90 minutes down from Nottingham, down in the middle of, uh, of the UK. And I was on the radio. I was actually on the radio for 10 years, which was really cool until it stopped being cool in around about 2005. But this was me at the beginning of my career. And uh, one of the things that uh, the, the guy on the left, whose name is Mark, who talks like this, and he's still on the radio now. He's on a radio station called Planet Rock. Very nice guy, Mark. Swears a lot off air. And uh, one of the things that Mark taught me, because Mark taught me how to be a good radio presenter, he taught me that if you've got something important you want people to say, you have to repeat the core message until you are sick of it. So back on the radio, if we let's say we were giving away a car, which happened, you know, once or twice a year, we would say we've got a competition. And then half an hour later, we'd say we've got a competition. And then half an hour later, we'd say it again. And we'd repeat it again and again and again and again and again and again. And then after two weeks, all of the radio presenters would be so sick of talking about this car we were giving away. But Mark, who was our boss, would keep saying, no, you've got to keep promoting it. Keep talking about it. Keep talking about it. Because what he said was, and he was absolutely right on this, is... You are, uh, you're hearing it every single time that you say it. This is no different to you sitting through quarterly business reviews or just talking to your clients. Your brain is hearing you say this thing again and again and again and again and again. You're hearing yourself saying it 60, 70, 80 times in a short period of time. But each of your clients is hearing it once. If you sit down with a client, let's say once a year, and you just go and have a lunch with them or just a, just a catch-up meeting, and you talk about cybersecurity, they're hearing it once last year, once this year, once next year. And on top of that, you're not just battling the fact they're not hearing the message that often. You're also battling a part of their brain, their brain, which is there to filter out noise. It's a little part of our brain just around about here, which is called the reticular activating system. And it has loads of different functions. But what affects uh, the way we market to the brain is that it acts as a sensory filter. Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to come back to Tesla's again. Have you ever, well, think about what car you drive right now, right? So let's say, let's say you drive a car and you're thinking, well, no, let me ask you a better question. What's the car you want next? It's always easy to do with cars because most people drive. So what's the car you want next? Just think in your head. So I currently have a Tesla um, and they've just unveiled a new, like a refurbed, uh, they've remodeled it. And my lease runs out next year and I'm thinking, I'm going to get one of those new ones because they look sexy. And uh, here's what happens. As I'm driving down the motorway, and I'm driving along and I can be yapping away to my daughter who sat next to me. And out of the corner of my eye, without actively thinking about it, I will suddenly see another Tesla. And in fact, before I got the Tesla, when I had a BMW and I knew I was going to go and get this Tesla, uh, I, I would be driving along, we'd be talking away and I'd say, Tesla. And I'd, I'd see it at the corner of my eye and I'd, without even looking at it. Maybe you're the same when you go to another town on holiday and you see the other MSPs. You see the tech repair shops, right? So this, now you see all of this stuff and you think it's normal for this. Here's the thing. You're actually on the car thing. You're also seeing the BMWs, the Audis, the Chevrolets, the Buicks, the whatever, hundreds of other car brands that are out there. But they are not entering your conscious mind because the reticular activating system is filtering them out. Same when you're on holiday, your eyes are seeing the dentists. The, the optometrists, the veterinarians, they're seeing all the kind of shops which don't interest you at all. So you're not being notified about it. Essentially, you don't perceive them. You see them, you'll see them with your eyes, but you, they're never reaching your conscious brain. The reticular activating system is the filter for this. And this is another reason why we need to keep repeating the message again and again and again, because we've got to break through that reticular activating system. This is why, by the way, the more relevant you can make it to them, the more likely they are to actually pay attention because relevance makes something real. Real gets through the reticular activating system. OK, we're on the final part. We're about three minutes from done and then we'll answer questions. Part five is about removing choice. And this is a this is the kind of the 
Uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The controversial one that uh, I get the most questions on because some MSPs just completely disagree with me on this. And that's fine. Let me tell you what I think is best practice. And of course, you pick what you think is best for you. But I believe because of all the reasons we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, because they don't understand, because they make bad choices, because they think it'll never happen to them, because they don't realize that £100 or $100 a month can take much of the risk away if they invest in the tools you want them to invest in, I think sometimes you have to protect them from themselves. And that, I think, is most easily done by removing choice. Let me give you an example. Do In fact, I can give you a real example from, from today. I have a very uh, bad knee injury. I'm a runner. Or rather, I haven't run this year because in January this year, I, I did 15 miles on a small knee injury and I've torn a part of my knee called the meniscus. And it's a really bad tear. I can't run on it. Some days I can barely walk on it. And I went to see uh, uh, my, my doctor and the doctor recommended six months ago that he said, look, he said, this isn't going to heal by itself. You need surgery. And I said, you know what, let's give it a few more months to see if it'll heal. And without smirking at me, because he must have heard it a lot, the doctor uh, said to me, he said, OK, I'll see you in six months time. And guess what today? Today I had my follow up appointment and I've signed up for the surgery, which hopefully I'll have at Christmas. So and, and yeah, there was no smugness from the doctor. But let's be honest, you know, do most people if this was urgent and, and you know, I've got a bit of pain, but it's more inconvenience. But if it was urgent, if it was something serious, I just go with what the doctor says. Right. I don't tend to pick my medical treatments. I tend to trust the doctors. I'll ask questions, but I'll still trust the doctors. And I do wonder with your clients whether you can take a similar approach. So with new clients, that's actually really easy. As part of the sales process, you can say to them, right, with cybersecurity, there is only one choice. It's either my way or the highway. We require you to have, now we're not going to use the word stack because stack is not a word that normal people use. But for when you, if you want to come and work with our MSP, we require you to have our basic uh, or our, our, our standard protection, or even our advanced protection. There is a certain cost to that. There is a certain, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 it will hold, not hold back. It'll be a sm slight impact on productivity because we're using things such as two-factor authentication. But we believe that will give you a 98.72% protection against uh, most cyber attacks. That's so I can sleep well at night, that's so you can sleep well at night, and Mr. or Mrs. Client, or Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, if you will not accept that, we cannot work with you. Which, by the way, taking that kind of authority position actually makes you more attractive. You, the, the sales you lose taking that approach are the idiots that you didn't want to work with anyway, because they were never going to be properly invest. But someone who sees that they have to invest, and, and we might be talking, this is the cost of managed services, and this is the cybersecurity on top, which is also a smart thing to do, by the way, because if you would put all the cybersecurity into the, to, I know bundling is very popular and I love bundling, but if you put all the cybersecurity into the managed service, you've got to struggle in years ahead as more and more cybersecurity services come out and you want to increase them, but all they see is the bill going up. Whereas actually, if you split out, you've got telecoms and you've got uh, support or managed services and you've got uh, cybersecurity, you can grow that cybersecurity cost and show them how it's getting more and more and more dangerous. So as I say, that's really, really easy. Uh, uh, to do with uh, with new clients, you just make an advanced level of cybersecurity as standard. Now, the hardest thing to do or the harder thing to do is for existing clients. And I think there are two ways that you can do it. The polite way is please, will you upgrade? You, you make it as real to them as possible. You keep repeating the message and you say to them, please, will you upgrade? Uh, the other way, which I do think there comes a point you have to do this, is we are upgrading you. And I have a growing number of MSPs that I have worked with and I'm working with where they've reached that point. And they're, they're typically legacy clients that have been around for years. You know that client that you've had for seven years and they're still not quite up to paying what everyone else is paying. That also means that their, their cybersecurity protection isn't quite there either. So there does come a point where you have to say, hey, we are upgrading you. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm conscious I'm going over a uh, time a little bit and I will be done in one minute, George. Um, I'm just going to show you um, some some uh, some materials which we actually make available to our MSP Marketing Edge members. I'm just going to show you briefly so you can take a quick screenshot and, and examine it further later. So this is a sample of a letter uh, that we send out. It's not the full letter, but it gives you an idea. Um, please don't just steal that because obviously that's, that's my thing for my uh, members, but you're more than welcome to be inspired by that. It gives you an idea of, of what you say to your client. Send them out a letter, 
book a Zoom with them uh, as a follow up to answer their questions. If they don't want to, um, if they don't want, and, and then in that letter, you might go into um, some of the benefits and some of the reasons why you do that. Um, if they absolutely don't want to do it, we'll come on to what you can do with that in a second. Um, but this, I'm going to take this off the screen in three, two, one. I'm sure, you're on top of the screenshots. If not, just get the recording and you can screenshot it from that. The reason you do this is this is about you sleeping well at night. And I'm sure you, I know many MSPs have lain awake at four in the morning. You've got up for a wee and you lie there awake and you're thinking, I know that we we are covered as an MSP, but I know some of our clients are not well covered. And actually, I, I'm terrified that if they have a problem, it's going to be a rabbit hole. And I don't want to do that. And why, why should you lie awake at night worrying about that when these are clients they're paying you money for a service. It, the only reason they're not paying you money to be protected is because you haven't asked for the money yet or forced them into a corner to doing that. And those that don't want to do it, I have found that a, a simple disclaimer can be a very, very powerful sales tool. Now, this is one that we use. Um, I think we got this. We were given it, gifted it by MSP Easy Tools. So thank you to Andrew and Jean for that. And we've adapted it for our members. But again, just screenshot this. Um, this is actually designed to be a persuasion tool, an influence tool, rather than a disclaimer. So it's not legally binding, but you can go through with them. Don't just give this to them and ask them to sign it. Sit down with them and just run through these items and ask them to fill out uh, or ask them to give you the answer to each of these. So you can tick and tick and tick and show them where they are and protected, but then critically Basically ask them to sign this disclaimer at the bottom. And as I say, this is not legally binding in any way at all. It's not meant to be a legal tool and wouldn't stand up in any court anywhere in the world. But what it is supposed to do is to get them to look at that and think, maybe actually we should have a conversation about this. Because when someone asks you to sign something, uh, you realise that actually it's getting serious. So we are done. I'm so sorry for going over. Um, George? No, no, you. not at all. No, thank you so much, Paul. Really, really appreciate the, the insight you shared. And, and definitely, guys, that the Q&A is open, so please drop a question in there. So just while we wait for, for um, some of those to come through, Paul, there's you know a couple of things I, I wanted to go back and, and touch on because so much great content there. I think for, for MSPs, that's a, a great, simple, uh, but easy to remember format of, of relevant, repeat, remove choice. And you know, I think a lot of MSPs and technical folk, we hear about cybersecurity, malware, where all those buzz buzzwords all day every day but um do you see a lot of msps that you work with um kind of get fatigue around that and kind of um you know don't don't go through the the, the repeat step step enough i mean if you are going to go through relevant repeat and remove choice from the msps you work with what do you think is is the step that that uh often trip, trips them up or that they don't give enough attention to yeah, 100%. That's a, that's a really good observation. And fatigue is a great word, because let's be honest, managed services is hard enough as it is, right? And then, you know, cybersecurity, which has always been there in the last, I mean, I've only been in this world, as I say, till 26, since 2016. But even I've noticed how cybersecurity of 2016 was, was something and now it's almost everything. And, you know, I, I think it's very easy to get tired and fatigued and fed up of telling your clients what you need to do. That's where I think that remove the choice thing comes in. And it is um, it, it is controversial. I've had people tell me I'm completely wrong uh, and they'd rather go down the please upgrade or or rather just sit back and do nothing, which, which is never a good answer. But I do think by removing choice and accepting, right, I'm going to sell some more services to my clients. Obviously, I'm going to make some margin on those. There's nothing wrong with margin. We're in business to make a profit, to have a great lifestyle. We're not in business uh, you know, to, to, to subsidize other businesses. So I'm going to sell them some extra stuff. Yes, I'm going to make a margin, but you know what? I'm going to sleep better at night. They're going to be better protected. Everybody wins. Everyone wins. The, the only losers are the cyber criminals, and, and we just push them off to the to the many, many easy targets out there. So yes, I think if you do find yourself fatigued, I think you just have to you just have to deal with it. I know it's hard. If you've got 50 clients, it's a nightmare. If you've got account managers, account managers will will sidestep it because it's a nightmare. But it's, you know, it's not, come on, you, you guys know this more than I do. This is not going to get easier, right? This is not going to go away. I think we can all look forward. Uh, it's very hard to look more than about five years in, in the channel, but we can look forward a few years and see more MSSPs, managed security service providers. We can see more security solutions. Someone told me the other day, is it something like there are four new cybersecurity solutions launched every day or something, something crazy like that? There's an insane number of new solutions coming out. And actually what a lot of these solutions are, they're, they're just part of your security stack. 
And as, we never use that phrase to the clients, but you, you, as I'm sure you are, are constantly reviewing your security stack and what can you do to better protect yourself and protect them? And yes, I know that's tiring, but, uh, but you know, I think every MSP has to say, right, how do we resource this? Maybe, maybe sharing it. Maybe as part of a peer group or as part of something else and, and having a working party or working with a, some other MSPs. You know, there are lots of different ways you can get together with people. And I think sometimes sharing that burden can be a good idea or sharing it internally as well. If you've got a service desk manager or just a tech, you know, if, if you're a smaller business, just a tech that you can share that that burden with. So it's not just you doing it on your own. I think I think one of the things I see a lot of modern and successful MSPs do is, um, which, which can often be kind of a, a, a difficult because technical focused, often more introverted, but like standing up and being like, I am an IT expert. And to your point, like my way or the highway kind of thing. And I'm being that leader. We live in this digital age now where everybody's online, everything's done through a computer. Uh, and indeed, everyone's sort of IT IQ is at a much higher baseline than it was back in 2008, even 2015. COVID with everyone working from home now has really catapulted that forward. We continue to see SaaS applications, you know, explode and everyone just wants to be good at their job using those. I'm going to have to ask you what little tool you were using there for sharing your uh, your, your screen uh, as part of the presentation. That was great. But I think with, with for MSPs, it comes back to, I'm the IT expert. It is my way or the highway. This is what I'm offering. And if there's nitpicky clients, guys, like it's okay to fire bad clients. And indeed, you will see more time free up for you to focus you know, on your business instead of being focused in the business, right? And I feel like freeing up that time to get that done is uh, is super important. One other comment I wanted to, to highlight as well was around removing that choice. The second part you mentioned around just, we are upgrading you. Uh, an interesting fact to share with everyone on the call is, I think it's Denmark and Costa Rica have the highest organ donation rate in the world in terms of registered or organ donors. Uh, and the, the reason for that is because unlike most of the other countries, it's an it's an automatic opt-in. So if you do not want to donate your organs uh, when you become deceased, you have to go through the administrative process of, of removing yourself. And so the vast majority of people just don't do that. So even we have, uh, uh, with some of our Augment partners, our MSP partners, we've seen them do that where they just say, listen, Cybersecurity is a big priority. Hacking and breaches are at an all-time high. We're bumping you up to this level. So this is what you're going to see this on your next invoice. If you want to opt out, like here's what you need to do. And the vast majority of people just go, okay. So I think yeah. it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a strong tactic. Yeah, and that's that's where I think something I mentioned earlier about um, splitting your invoice out into these different areas um, helps you to justify that cost. You know, if, if 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 they look, people do compare invoices year on year sometimes, and if they can see that it's actually it's the cybersecurity element that's got bigger, the support element has just had a you know a ten percent rise or whatever your price rise is, then that that's a, a, an easier thing to justify than just lumping it into one big bill. <laughs> Here's your yeah. bill, <laughs> but it's, but it's bill. two thousand dollars more than it was last year. I know. Uh, don't make me break that down. I know. I know. By the way, that that creates um, automation issues and integration issues and getting your software, your, your account software to do it, but it is worth doing. You know, if, if it keeps the client for another three, four years, then it's worth doing. Exactly. So guys, what we'll do just to, to, to wrap up, we've got a couple of questions, but just before we do, I just want to do a quick plug for, for Augment and show something that you guys all have access to for joining today, uh, which ties in beautifully with, which, uh, with what Paul was saying, which is our Microsoft 365 threat report. So whenever you sign up for a trial of Augment, guys, this is something you will actually get access to for free uh, for forever. And so as the kind of the, the kind of quick plug at Augment, we're all about simplifying uh, my, Microsoft 365 security uh, and eliminating shadow shadow IT. So understanding that your client's number one business application is more than likely going to be Microsoft. That's where you should start with cybersecurity. That's where you should start with highlighting the risks of cybercrime. And this is an easy way to do it. You can jump into the threat report, pick your client, whoever you want. We're fully multi-tenant and it automatically pulls in all the information associated with risk into this dynamic user-friendly report. So instead of having to piecemeal this together, portal by portal, client by client, user by user, pull this in and that's where you can start to have that conversation and use some of those tactics and conversations that Paul was talking about. So there's a, a lot of risk here. It's going up over time. You're a dentist in Nottingham. So why are we seeing things happening in Australia and in Russia? Your secure score and identity scores aren't good. 
Oh, and you're the business owner, Mr. Bradley. Well, here you are as actually the number one account at risk. So again, to Paul's point about, you know, that fear of loss, making it real for them. Here's some of this is this is actively happening. You're actively being targeted here. All the things that are happening. Here's some people that don't even have MFA on. And most people in this day and age know now what MFA is. A lot of end users see it as, you know, a burden and an irritation to productivity. But, you know, Microsoft had this crazy stat in 2020, 99.9% of compromised accounts they tracked every month were not using MFA. So for me, turning on MFA is kind of like 101 cybersecurity, get it done. And then highlighting things like inactive accounts, like are these people still at the company? Have they not been offboarded properly? Ultimately, what it allows you to do, guys, is finish up a, a kind of conversation saying, how do you want me to handle the risk I've uncovered for you today? And whether it's an existing client in terms of highlighting the need for, for that service or a prospect saying, this is why you need to come uh, and partner with me as your MSP. It's a very powerful tool. And the last thing I'll finish on that's a really strong thing uh, is, is a poll touched on it too, signing sort of a, a denial of service or, or risk acceptance letter is a habit that you guys should really get into. And without getting too deep into sort of, you know, litigious nature, we've actually already had three of our clients, um, you know, won't name names, but they've, they've gone through that process. They've highlighted the risk. The customer basically said, nah, not interested, too cheap. And then six months later, a cyber incident happened, breach, whatever. And so they arrived at the MSP's door with their insurance and their lawyers and said, you know, this is all your fault. You're my IT guy. We're going to sue you. And, the, and, and in all three of these cases, the MSPs went, yep, that's fine. Just one second. Went and got the cyber security risk assessment that included this report and said, here's where we highlighted all of this risk to you uh, six months prior. And here's where you signed and said, no, I'm I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for it because I'm not going to pay you to fix it. So these are some of the habits that you guys want to build in. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, so anyone can sign up for that report, guys, head over to the Augment website. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, you can reach out to me as well. But we do have um, uh, one question that, that's come in here. So thanks, Carrie, for your for your comment as well. Carrie, uh, Paul was just saying that that's exactly what he does at his MSP. It's very much a, this is what you get. Uh, or you're you're not uh, an, an MSP, or sorry, we're not your MSP. So kind of the my way or the highway uh, approach resonating strongly there. Uh, one of the other questions we got through Paul um, was around sort of just getting started. So marketing, you know, a lot of MSPs come from a very technical background. And so marketing is often one of the biggest hurdles or barriers to them. And this is something even a conversation that I see a lot of is like, well, where do I start or what's a simple process that I can do to, to, to start ramping up my marketing activities? So would you have any recommendations around that in terms of marketing 101? Is it setting aside every Tuesday to just close the laptop, get a pen and paper, sticky notes and do that? Or, or what kind of things do you offer uh, and encourage your, your clients that, uh, that you work with today? I'm, uh, I'm famous for, for giving long answers to short questions, and that's actually a massive question. So if you've, question, got two, if you've got two hours, I'll answer it. No, I will give you the 30-second the, the version, which is um, activity, right? So most MSPs just don't do enough marketing activity. So if you can find 60 to 90 minutes every weekday to do some marketing, that in itself is, is the biggest possible win. And, and doing it daily rather than, let's say, a Tuesday, because if you, you, you dedicate a day of the week, it's very easy for that day to get lost or caught up with a problem. Or, oh, we've got to go and fix this or install that. You do 60 to 90 minutes every day, and particularly if you do, try and do it at the same time. Just doing some marketing, that would be great. In terms of what do you do, the, the, the two core activities are building audiences and building relationships with those audiences. So your audiences include your, well, the two most basic ones are your LinkedIn connections and your email database. And you can actually link the two. So anyone you connect to on LinkedIn, find their email address. It's a Google search away and you add it into their email database. There's, there's some caveats that go around that, but it's, it's generally a fairly uh, simple and safe thing to do. So build your audiences every day and then build a relationship with them. And that's about putting content in front of them. So posting on LinkedIn every single day, that's seven days a week. You can schedule content now. Once every 24 hours is, is the golden rule. Uh, so, so you only post a maximum of once every 24 hours and send out an email once a week to your email database. Even if there's only seven people on it, get into the habit of sending that out. So we build audience of, audiences of people, build a relationship with them. Uh, and then what will happen is you're not going to get any clients out of that, but you're starting to get people who you could talk to in the future. It takes so long for someone to be ready to talk to another MSP. You know, if they're thinking of switching, they have to be very unhappy to switch. 
Because you know what we were saying earlier about people don't know what they don't know. Well, that instills a certain level of fear and it makes them more likely they'll stay with an incumbent that they don't like. Pe- you, everyone knows that people will, will sign new contracts with MSPs that they've sat and criticised for two hours uh, just because it's, it's better the devil you know. So what we're trying to do is to build a relationship with these people so that in the future, at the point that they're nearly ready, willing and able to switch from one MSP to another, you can actually have a conversation with them. And that becomes the next part of that question, which is how do we commercialise that database? We'll leave that for on, for another day. We did have one other question that just came in there, Paul, at the end from Tyler Martin. Thanks, Tyler. It's that he said, a lot of businesses around our area have this mentality of what I've been doing has always been fine. So what would help to help them understand the severity of security issues without pressing too hard? Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And obviously, you do, you do see geographical areas are very, very different. I work with MSPs all over the world in rural areas, urban areas, in something like 22 different countries. And, and you do see very different things. The if it ain't broke, uh, I'm not changing it approach. Um, th- there's only one answer to that, which is it's broke. You know, the the a lot of the stuff we've just been talking about, about taking removing choice and making it real to them, showing them, you know, go and get yourself a laptop infected with with uh, ransomware uh, so so you can make it real to them. Um, find, you know, all, all the things we've just talked about in this webinar, you, you have to show them that actually the, 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 the way we did things in the past has always been fine for us isn't valid anymore. I mean, you, you could argue just for the pace of change. You look at AI, you look at cybersecurity and just... The, the way that we work, you know, I mean, it's it's three years on from from when we all did um, work from home uh, for the pandemic, and uh, and and we've we've forgotten that we we did, uh, you know, we did sort of five ten years worth of progress in in six months. Um, th- this work from home thing and this Zoom thing and all of this stuff, it was it was ex- it's accelerated at a pace that none of us realised, and and that's become the norm. So everything is changing fast i think it's down to you and and to use your position of authority and it's not easy but it's down to you to use your position of authority to show them what actually things have moved on quite a lot i think the the only other thing that you could use as your power uh, as a superpower for this is something called social proof so social proof is where most people prefer to do what most other people are doing and particularly people like them. So let's say you were working with a CPA, an accountant. Let's say you had five CPAs on your books and you've got a CPA who, because we all know how tight accountants can be and they've got their arms folded and they're saying, well, I'm not, I'm not investing in this. We didn't need that in 1987, so I don't know why we need it now. And you can say to them, well, we work with five CPAs and the other four, they they all buy this from us now and they all take these protections. Uh, and, and that, in fact, here's a testimonial or a review because so- social proof is case studies, testimonials, reviews. That's the practical form of it. You can say, well, look, here's a case study for another CPA we're working with. It shows you where they were before, which is where you are now. It shows you why they picked the thing we're offering and it shows you how happy they are with the outcome because they're now 99.4 percent protected from from most cybersecurity threats and it means there's no interruption to their business sometimes it's easier for other people to influence the person you're talking to than you you, you know even though you're a trusted expert you're still selling them something you're still a supplier but they are mu- much more likely to listen to other people particularly other people they perceive to be like them great and Paul, last up, I know, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of, of your podcast. I think that there's always like excellent content on there. And I know for a fact from speaking to uh, numerous MSPs, uh, there's a lot of fans out there of your newsletter as well. Uh, it seems to be one of the ones that that genuinely provides some some great uh, insight and content. But okay. for anyone who's who's more interested in some of the, the work you do, uh, the, the activities that you share with, with MSPs, the, um, you know, what's a good way for them to get get in touch with you, um, Paul? green yeah sure so I, I think the best episode of the podcast by the way is the one that you were on george i can't remember which episode that was because next week we actually hit episode 200 so it's been going for for about four years or so uh, but we have a website uh, paul greens msp marketing.com so don't forget the s paul greens msp marketing.com there's a learning hub there with about 500 articles and videos things to help you with your uh, marketing we also have a facebook group so if you go into facebook and search for msp marketing look for groups that's free to join george you can't join because you're a vendor it's a vendor free zone i know i'm so sorry uh, but you get to email me so that's okay uh, it's a vendor free zone so we've got around i think 2000 msps there and that's free come and join us there and as i said earlier we do have a paid program it's called the msp marketing 
marketing edge. We only work with one MSP per area. And you'll see why when you go on the website. So you can go in and put in your postcode or your zip code and check to see if your area is still available. And that's at mspmarketingedge.com. Get in and lock down your postcode. I love it. Awesome. Well, th again, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. I think you've definitely set the tone for this series. Uh, I'm sure Jennifer will watch this and be quaking in her boots. So she folks uh, for, who, were, who were on the line, don't forget that next week we do have the part two follow-up that focuses on sales with Jennifer Bleem, where we'll be talking about demonstrate, don't argue, uh, and talking about how you can use some of these marketing activities to influence your sales and ultimately close deals and get some money uh, in the door with with new clients or upselling to existing clients. So thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. Paul, again, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye.